masterclass we have today. Um, we're, today we're going to learn how to source products from the US, from America for your e-commerce business. Okay, so I'm super excited. I've invited Jared Ha to be on the, the live call today and he's gonna go over a, a rundown of some of um, the do's and don'ts of sourcing from the US. And um, so I'm super excited to have Jared on our call today. How are you doing, Jared? Doing pretty well. How about yourself, Gary? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I, I mean, we are live. This is totally unscripted. And then I got into this little accident this morning because I was in a rush. And then, you know, my throat is like my voice is going. So I'm like, I popped this, this cough drop. And then it was like in a foil package. I just like popped it in my lip. And then it cut my lip. So my lip is actually a little bleeding right now. And, you know, we are <laughs> live. So if, I do have to apologize if I look like you know, I got into a fight, but I did not trust me. <laughs> All right. So, um, you could just say that's your son's you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My, my son is a uh, quite a feisty one, a little guy, <laughs> but, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, Jared, um, today I'm just super excited to have you on. Um, Jared is the president of ePower Corp and it's an American owned manufacturer with a factory and production facility in China. Okay. At the same time, Jared is American and then he is in the US right now because of the coronavirus with his family. And at the same time, he's noticed that there's this new opportunity opening up manufacturing in the States because of all these you know, different issues with sourcing abroad and you know, with uh, the tariffs and trade war. So right now, Jared, Jared is analyzing opening up a production line in the US. And Jared has helped many seven and eight figure e-commerce sellers, uh, retail business owners, with their supply chain needs so um that's why i decided to bring on jared with us here today okay and for you guys that are watching live okay if you can see if you can see us can you please type your name and where you're watching from in the window so we know okay so i'm just gonna try to stop this cut uh <laughs> this thing is live and totally unscripted but um it was not planned okay so hi uh Hi, Unison. Hello, Brownwin from Australia. Hey, Kay from Chicago and Richard from Canada. So, I mean, the beauty of this is that we are watching all over the world. Jared, where are you calling from tonight? Cleveland, Ohio. Cleveland, okay. Yep. How's the situation in Cleveland? I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on in the States, I know, but how is everything? Yeah, so it's all, I think it's tense everywhere right now. Everywhere you go, mm. it's pretty tense. Um, yeah. So in where I'm at, I'm between Cleveland and Akron. It's 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 no different here. Shops are closing down early, um, mm -hmm. especially with a stay-at-home order. Um, yeah. So it's it's made uh, this time a bit more you know strenuous. I I guess. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just you know with COVID and with all the the protests and, I mean, I'm just glad that at least people we can tune in from home or from a safe place, I hope. So I hope, you know, everyone continues to do well, um, regardless of the circumstances. And, you know, one of the common themes I've noticed with successful entrepreneurs is that, you know, they find a way around, you know, challenges, roadblocks in their way. So that's why I thank you everybody for watching live and coming on today. Okay, so before we get started, um, just a quick overview of the training today. So who is this training for? Um, the training is for e-commerce entrepreneurs, Amazon sellers, or small business owners that are interested in sourcing, you know, away from abroad, uh, away from China or, you know, foreign countries and considering sourcing from the U.S. Okay. So Jared is going to offer training and then he's going to cover both the good news and the bad news about sourcing from the U.S. I mean, I want to be transparent. We're not going to say, oh, you know, it's wonderful. It's easy. It's, it's not, okay? So I think the important thing is that you guys can take away, you know, the good side and the bad side of sourcing from the US. So you can make a conclusion whether or not this is appropriate for your businesses, okay? So um, to kick off, Jared, um, and also thank you everybody for submitting your questions. We had over a hundred questions come in, which is awesome, but we can't, we don't have enough time for to cover everyone's questions. So. I did um, a quick summary of the different main points and we're gonna go over them today, okay? So um, let's just go ahead and dive right in. So first off, Jared, why should an e-commerce business consider sourcing from the US? 
So right now, the supply chain side is is tense all over the world. Uh, there's really no safe place, you know, whether it's going to be made in uh, China or Vietnam. The only safe place that we could count on would be uh, America. So a lot of Chinese factories right now they are looking to get out of China. They're looking at other more cost-effective regions such as Vietnam, Malaysia, Cambodia. However, you know this kind of doesn't really improve the value of uh, for the end clients. So we're kind of looking at America right now and kind of how how uh, how we could build value right now for um, you know for moving production from China to America. Mm, interesting. Okay, and then uh, what is the current sentiment of you know Americans buying products made in the USA over imports? Um, do you feel they really will pay a, a price premium for a product made in the USA? You know, I would really like to see uh, what your followers have to say about this. Uh, I think their voice would be much stronger than mine as they're communicating with uh, their clients. However, uh, you know, it depends on the region you're at. However, uh, but I think a lot of people want to start seeing more made in America. They're probably not interested in seeing made in Vietnam, made in Malaysia. Uh, they want to see things more made in America. And this also does depend on the type of product that you are selling. If, you're, if your product is more price sensitive, uh, maybe they don't really care. But if your product has some sort of uniqueness, there's just one or two different uh, competitors out there, made in America might make the difference, even if it is 10, 15, 20% more expensive. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And we did get um, some responses in our pre-call survey, you know, about this question. Um, so we asked two questions about this that, uh, that Jared, that you posed, actually. Number one is what kind of price increase would you accept for moving production to America? So we had over 120, we had about 129 responses. 47% uh, of the responses are willing to accept the price increase of 20% or more for moving production to America. And then another 37.2% were willing to accept a price increase of 10 to 15%, okay? So if you add that up, that's about, I think that's almost like 84% are willing to accept a price increase of 10% or 20% or more, which is astounding. You know, I, I didn't think that, you know, that people were, were that, um, you know, tolerant with price increases. And then the other very interesting question that, uh, we pose to the readers, uh, to you guys, actually, is would you accept a price increase of 15% to receive your products 30 days earlier? Okay, price increase of 15% uh, to get your product 30 days earlier, and 64% said yes. Okay, so it looks like, you know, based on this, there's a lot, of, there is a lot of interest in, um, you know, paying a little bit of a premium to get that made in USA product and to get it faster. Okay, right. so... Um, yeah, so going back to this question, you know, why should a business should consider sourcing from the U.S.? Um, what would you say the good news is? Let's talk about the good news first. Uh, so the good news is, uh, you know, sourcing from the states, it's obviously going to be faster. Um, you know, you don't have that lead time on the boats. Um, if you are going to be doing some sort of plastic injection molded parts, you might want to get the tool from China shipped to America. So you will have that uh, that longer lead time, but that's only for the first order. For all of the other orders, it's always going to be 30 days uh, faster, assuming you always ship via sea. Um, another good thing is that you could hold American suppliers more accountable than you can, you know, any other Chinese supplier. I've I've worked with some Alibaba type of suppliers, and they do anything just to try to close a deal. They're constantly messaging you. And then once there's a quality problem, they kind of disappear. Um, I'm sure everyone that's listening has probably felt this or have seen it. That won't happen in America. There's That will never happen. You could always hold your suppliers accountable. It's not like it's in China where they could change a name, get a new tax ID or whatever it is, and then um, start a new factory. You, you can't really do this in America. Your, your problems follow you. Your debt follows you. Uh, you can't really get out of jail uh, that quickly. Um, so I would say those are kind of like the two main things with the good news. Um, and also another good news is that it is actually becoming more cost effective. And that's just not because China is becoming you know, more expensive. 
but uh, the U.S. is gaining a little bit more of a competitive advantage with the prices. This is going to be true for plastic injection molded parts, silicon parts, um, and even certain things that need final assembly. Um, so I would say those are the main three things uh, that we see um, on the states that have uh, some pretty good news. I see. And how about the quality level? Like, would you say the quality level? Like, how would that compare? So the qual, so the quality, I believe, is built into the design. Um, so let's say if you have a plastic injection molded parts, uh, the quality of that part is strongly correlated to to the design of the product. So it's going to be to the product and to the tool. So if your design sucks, your quality is going to suck. Um, there's right. really no two ways around it. It doesn't matter if it's my factory making it or another factory making it. If, you're, if your design's not good, no factory in the world, me, Foxconn, or any other Alibaba supplier is going to save this and to you know make it good. Um, right. So my suggestion would always be to have a factory that's able to help you with the design of the products. Um, and that's one of the things that if you source from an Alibaba supplier or you're sourcing like this and you don't own the design you're you're really putting a lot of faith into the factory that they know what they're doing with the design that they know right. how to design it uh they know how to engineer it um so that's that is one uh pretty big issue that you see with the with the quality so on the quality for the american side i it is so far pretty good um mm -hmm. they're very technical uh which is good um i know sometimes when you're speaking with a chinese supplier when things get technical things always get lost in translation it's not going to be translated well maybe their baidu translate or google translate's not really working well that day um and things will slip through the cracks when you're speaking english to a to another american supplier things really don't get lost in the cracks every there's right. a lot of due diligence especially on the supplier side to make sure that when things go into production you are going to be getting what you want every single time right that makes sense okay so we've talked a little bit about the good news the us is faster you don't have to put it on a boat that takes a month you can hold the us suppliers more accountable um, they're less likely to disappear um, it's starting to become more cost effective in the us and um, jared I know that you will have a, a very short case study at the end, so you know people have can get a better understanding of the cost uh, difference and um, quality. It depends on the design. That makes sense. So let's let's go to the other side of the coin. What about the bad news? Why don't you break this to us and uh, just go ahead and be, give it to us straight, Jared? So well, it's uh, so it's, it's not all bad, but there is some bad. Um, mm -hmm. The the most. Probably the worst thing, especially for the people listening, is that there's no Alibaba equivalent. Some people asked about Thomas Net, and it's not the same as Alibaba. Um, unfortunately, there's only one Alibaba, you know, everywhere in the world, and I don't think there's anything like it in India. There's, you know, maybe some knockoffs or something like that, but definitely not as good. Um, so that would be one thing. There's no place where you could go for uh, to try to recreate a product or to see if anyone's willing to do private labels. You have to put in a little bit more research. Um, another bad thing is that there's really no companies out there, at least in America yet, that are able to do the whole process. So for example, let's say if you have like a garlic press or something like this, um, there's not gonna be one supplier that could make all the components and assemble it for you. Uh, you're going to have to, find uh, a supplier for the die cast, for the CNC, for the plastics, and then probably a supplier as well to assemble it. Uh, usually the, the assembling factories, they don't take the responsibility like the suppliers in China to procure all of the parts. Uh, so that means you're also gonna have payment terms with four or five different suppliers. It could be 10, 15, 20 uh, different suppliers. You're gonna have different payment terms and your supply chain becomes a lot more complex. Um, and probably the third thing is going to be price. Um, I said price could be a good thing, but it could also be a bad thing. This depends on the type of product that you have. We have found so far that plastics are pretty good and very competitive with manufacturing them in America. However, if you have metals, electronics, or other products like this, we lose some of that competitive advantage, not just by maybe five, 10, 15%, but maybe it'll be double or three times more here in the States than what it is in China. Interesting. Okay. So 
the bad news, there's no Alibaba equivalent. And in the US, I think this is like a big thing because a lot of people are not aware of this. No factory, or from what you're saying, if I understand correctly, Jerry, no factory can do the whole process like in China. In other words, they're not, you know, vertically integrated. They can't like, you know, provide the raw material, the, the tooling, the assembly, you know, packaging, everything. You you literally, if you want to source from the US, you have to find like these different part pieces of the puzzle of the supply chain. Does, does that sound right? And I think the reason for that is there's too much risk associated with that one supplier. So opening mm -hmm. up tools in America is it's a very, very expensive process. Um, right. Except, you know, if, if they go to China, it's more competitive. But yeah. If a factory opens up their own product, why would they not just sell it themselves and close it off to the public or you know, have substantial profits for that? Right. Uh, Alibaba companies or uh, you know, suppliers on Alibaba, they have to do this because they don't have the marketing skills to sell it on Am Amazon. I've heard this right. you know, many times from other uh, suppliers saying that we should link up because we have the marketing capabilities and they have the product. But um, right. that's, that's why a lot of Amazon or uh, sorry, American suppliers don't do that because if they're going to invest in that tool tooling and all of those, yeah. uh, the processes, why don't they just sell it themselves? They're just going to open up a shop. They're going to sell directly to Amazon or have their own store or go on or go to retail. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Okay. Um, meanwhile, we have some more people that jumped on the call. I just want to give some shout outs. Um, Megla, hey, from Singapore, and uh, Sean from South Florida, what's going on? Bruce from Sydney, Tim from Houston, Marianne from South Carolina, uh, Big Plus Giant Stuffed Animals from New York, New Jersey, what's going on? Uh, Brian from New Jersey, Peter from Sydney, LL from LA, Paulina from New Zealand, Mira from London, Leah from New Orleans, Raymond from Melbourne, Justin from Nashville, Angela from San Francisco, Yvonne from UK, Zuzi from Miami, Robin from Australia, uh, Bella from UK, Adam from New York, Emma from Australia, and Sally from Nipomo. Okay, I, I wish I could say hello to everyone, but we have a lot of people live on the call. So thank you everybody for joining. In. Okay, and then- hey, um, Gary, yeah. just a sec. Justin asked a question. I just wanna say yeah. it's Thomas Nett. Uh, yes. Thomas Nett, N-E-T, N -E -T, not, not Lane. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Thomas Net. Okay, thanks yeah. for the clarification, Jackie and um, Justin. Thanks for the clarification as well. So Thomas Net is a website that does feature some U.S. suppliers. Okay, and then there's another one called Makers Row. Uh, they're focused more on uh, clothing, um, you know, apparel and stuff like that. Okay, I but agree. there's no supplier that can replace Alibaba. And then I do apologize for the background noise. You know why? We have a baby, we're working from home, so, uh, and this is live, so please bear with us, thank you. All right, um, so talking about the products, you know, a lot of people have this question, um, you know, what type of products can you expect to be manufactured in the US? Can you find like, you know, Amazon, Amazonable type products, consumer products from factories in the US? What so do you yeah, think? I think the exciting thing is that anything could really be made here if you want to make it here. Uh, so you could see anything from, I mean, the, the most basic commodities being made here, such as bottles for hand sanitizers. Uh, you could actually get bottles for hand sanitizers made more cost effectively than here than in China. Um, you could also see everything then to the biggest components that cost tens of thousands of dollars being made here and everything really in between. Uh, so there is really no specific industry for products. Uh, you can make single shot molds here uh, to anything from, you know, to parts with thousands of different components. Uh, and that's what makes this really exciting and, you know, c c really opens up my eyes to the possibilities of, you know, the things that can be made here because I think it was more, you know, everyone said America is not cost effective. It's not cost effective. It's not cost effective. But then once you start to look into it, once you start to speak with the suppliers, once you start to organize a supply chain, figure out your assembly costs, your overhead, you actually have a different view of it. And you kind of start to realize that, you know, hey, this can actually work. It's it will be a bit harder to do. Uh, we have to be a bit stricter. Um, you know, the labor will be an issue here. But if we wanted to, it, it definitely can be made here. And that's, uh, you know, that that's not just going to be for cars, but everything from your most basic phone case all the way up to cars. 
I see. And earlier, Jared, you mentioned that in terms of pricing, plastic uh, plastics can be competitive, but metals may lose their advantage, may cost double compared to China. Would right. you conclude that if someone's you know selling like a plastic um, you know bottle, they could source it more? Uh, you know, lower price in the U.S. compared to like this um, this metal water bottle, for example. Yeah, I, w- I would say that actually. Um, mm-hmm. I would not just say you get it cheaper landed. So when I say more cost effective now, I mean landed. Uh, I don't mean yeah. what comes out of the, the the factory in China. I mean what's it's going to be after tariffs and then uh, shipping. It's going exactly. to be more cost effective to make it in the states, and, right? And it's you know it is maybe going to be about ten percent cheaper, at, you know, when you take into account tariffs. And when I analyze tariffs, I don't do twenty five percent. I usually do twenty percent because factories will be manipulating the value of the products, so the client doesn't have to pay such you know larger amounts. So I usually say twenty percent, uh, right. which you know is more conservative, uh, which is you know better, I guess. Um, but you'll also get it faster. You'll also, so you'll get it, uh, you know, more cost effective and you'll also get that money back into your pocket quicker. So the thing with right. China is that you have to wait, you know, plus 30 days to be able to get that buck in your pockets, uh, right. you know, which is huge for cash flow. Uh, right. But, you know, getting in America, you get it, you know, you only have to wait maybe 30 days and you can start selling that product. That's, right. that's you know, that's. That's exciting for, you know, not just factories, but for, you know, any sort of entrepreneur, anyone that's selling a product. That's that's great news for them. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, if you're like me, if you're sourcing a product from China, you know, you got to wait like, you know, 30 days for production. And then if it's like a big product, you know, you got to ship it by boat. So that's another 30 days and you got to, you know, truck it from the port to the Amazon fulfillment center and wait for them to inbound it. So if you're able to just, you know, manufacture it locally that saves you at least a month and at least for me if you know i'm out of stock and one of my best sellers right now i'm still waiting for china to you know to finish it and then ship it so if i can reduce that out of stock period like 30 days i mean that really helps my bottom line i mean with my cash flow so i think that that makes a lot of sense all right um and then along the same lines you know we've talked a little bit about the the pricing the quality and the delivery times right from the us but another key question is moq or the minimum order quantities what kind of moqs are expected compared with china yeah so i actually saw that someone uh, made a comment as well saying that they can't get an american factory on the phone because of the quantities um yeah. so that's not necessarily true but that could you know you could also see the same thing with certain Chinese manufacturers as well. Um, that's so, what's so great about Alibaba, I guess, because it brings MOQs lower. But my so far, uh, what my communications with uh, the suppliers, they've they've been they're very willing to have lower MOQs, and it's just like what it is in China. Um, lower MOQs are fine. You just have to pay for it. I was talking with some plastic injection molding suppliers. They have some orders. They just do a couple hundred a year. Um, and we're not talking huge products. I mean, we're talking products that are probably the size of a wallet. You know, they're, you know if you get those in you know, mass production doing thousands a month, uh, you know, they're going to be maybe 50 cents or something. But with lower volume, obviously, you have to pay for that. Um, but so this is all just it depends on the the suppliers that you're speaking with if you're if you're talking with a company uh, with a factory like Foxconn they're never going to talk with you know uh, anyone that I do business with um, even if they're a few million dollars a year they're oh, sorry a few million dollars a month they're still not large enough um, and there's going to be those same suppliers in the states they're too large to take on these smaller clients maybe they um, you know, they don't even have the manpower to have someone focus on. But if you go to one of these smaller mama pop shops, uh, maybe they only have about 30 people. These are the people that I'm personally going to right now just because, you know, they're looking for work, especially how the economy is going. Um, so, you know, it, it is just like China. It's who, who you're talking to, but they they will accept lower MOQs. Right. And then with lower MOQs, like, how much are we talking? I mean, for China, it usually is like 500 to start. What would you say is a bit? Yeah. yeah, I think 500 is fine here. Um, I mean, what I've seen, it's there's some they do a very, very simple product for just maybe a couple hundred a year. 
you know, just maybe mm -hmm. someone, or maybe they're just doing subcomponents. Uh, mm -hmm. So plastic injection molding suppliers, you know, they always, they don't always get like the big part of the project. Maybe there's thousands of parts or something, but maybe they only get 10 parts and they only have to do a couple hundred a year. That's tiny for them. Their MOQ is very, very small. Um, so they're still willing to take it on. So I would say, I mean, it could be even a couple hundred for an order to, you know, I think that'll be okay. Okay, sounds good. And then, you know, talking about these small mom and pop suppliers with low MOQs, I think that could be very attractive and very interesting to a lot of people watching. Um, so that leads us to the next question. Yeah. In terms of finding, like, where do we find these U U.S. manufacturers? So I know that, you know, you are, you've already said that there's no Alibaba for the U.S. And, you know, we've talked about a couple other sites like ThomasNet and Maker's Row. But, I mean, if you were in, you know, the, like, the, the audience's shoes right now, like, is there some type of playbook or, like, a systematic approach that you can, one can use to maximize time and efficient, efficiency? when sourcing from the US? No, <laughs> I've wasted hours <laughs> trying to do this. And that's, you know, that is a downside that it takes time. Um, luckily we have Google um, and I, I mean, I just type in plastic injection suppliers near me and I just look at them. Um, and then I think everyone listening, I think they know how to contact a supplier because you've taught them and you know, th there's been trainings with that. You just provide the same information. You know, you provide them what kind of product you're looking for, what kind of services you're looking for. Um, you know, if you want them to sign an NDA, I'm sure they'll be happy to sign an NDA. Um, and then you have to send them the drawings. And that's that's the big thing. Uh, a lot of people that contact Alibaba, they assume that they have the the files ready. They assume that they have all of the uh, all, all of the documents, which could be, you know, a little nerve wracking, especially for someone that's going to be uh buying from them because you don't know what you're getting you might not know the materials you might not know uh you know all of the specifications but if you have those drawings if you have the bill of materials all those specifications you hold that control and then you could provide those specifications drawings everything else to each uh each uh supplier so it will be more time consuming but you hold the control of the product uh there's not going to be any changes uh, made because if an Alibaba company or you know any supplier that owns the actual product, they own the tools. If they make the changes, they don't have to inform you of anything. If they if they make changes of the of the of the uh, of the materials, if they're changing it from PP to PA or POM or something like that, they don't have to tell you. Um, however, if you own the product, if you own the specifications, and you provide it to these different suppliers. They have to follow exactly what you are saying. So you know that no matter what, you're going to be getting the same product. So unfortunately, you you kind of have to spend some time on Google to, you know, get just plastic injection molding suppliers near me, um, electronic suppliers near me, die casting, CNC suppliers near me, final assembly suppliers near me. Um, and luckily, you know, Google you know has a huge database of you know that and you could just go to the maps and just go one by one and that's that's really what i've been doing um and i'm happy to say that i've had much more luck than bad luck with this um even though it is time consuming yeah interesting so it sounds like you know on the u.s side unlike a china alibaba supplier the u.s supplier they're not you know quote unquote vertically integrated so they don't have like they can't get the raw materials. They they can't get like the tooling. They don't have it readily available, right? So you have yeah. to do the legwork to do this. That's I feel like this is one of the key differences. This is something that I learned, you know, talking to Jared in our pre-call discussions. You know, you can't expect like the same Chinese supplier to exist in the U.S. that has you know the, all of the the materials. They know where to get them. They have the tooling. You can just like plug and play, right? You can just like slap your private label, your logo on them. You can just like buy it, manufacture it, and then ship it into the Amazon warehouse, right? It's it's not so simple. But at the same time, you know, with the, you know, the the risk, there's also the reward, right? Because the risk with the US right. supplier is that you guys spend more time doing this. But the reward is another, you know, like seller can't just buy your product and then, you know, sell it, right? Like unlike China, where there's so many copycats, Me Too products, you know, anybody can buy it you know, pretty much the same product if you're, you know, they know your supplier, right? So I think, you know, that's one of the, like the pros and cons, right? That, you know, a lot of people may not be aware about. 
uh, and aware of. Yeah. One annoying thing is that uh, so I was doing packaging, trying to source a package for uh, for a supplier. And they they have this handle right here. So this is the handle that yeah. goes around the box right here, and uh, around the cardboard corrugated uh, cardboard, and it becomes a handle. Mm -hmm. The supplier for the corrugated uh, package does not do this, so I have to source a supplier for this. And right. you know, that, right. just like doing that is ex extremely annoying. You know, yeah. in China, yeah. you just say, okay, if you can't have a like, if you're a packaging supplier and you can't get me this as well, why am I even speaking yeah. with you? That's ridiculous. Right. Right. In, you right. Know, in America, it's they're you know they're very like no we we won't do this and no we can't do this. Um, yeah. You know yeah. if, if you have a problem with it, find someone else. It's a you know yeah. kind of a different uh, mentality, but you kind of have to respect it. Uh, you know they stick to what they're good at. They don't want to mark up anything that they're getting from the outside and give it to you. They don't want to take on that risk of you know having you know buying someone else's quality. Uh, yeah. so you just have to source it yourself. Um, and yeah. maybe if you do this, if you source it yourself, you could get it for the best price. Yeah, that's true. Okay. And we have a couple of questions that came in. Um, one is from Mariam. So how can you make the manufacturer here not sell the product themselves besides patenting that? What do you so like? How would you make the factory not sell the product themselves? I believe that's that's her question. Yeah. Um. So that's. I mean, what I would say is you don't necessarily have to have a patent. I'm not a huge fan of patents. You know, sometimes you just don't need them, um, especially for some of the products that we take on that are you know maybe half a million dollars worth of tooling. Um, for a product like this, though. Um, it's usually you, you could have some sort of MOU, you could have some sort of NDA. Uh, if you have an NDA with a supplier, that basically means that they can't be taking your product and selling it to anyone else, which means selling it on Amazon. So if you have an NDA with them, I think that should be uh, good enough. Yeah. So in other words, have an agreement, a non-disclosure agreement, or even like a non-compete clause saying that um, they can't sell this, uh, you know, to compete against you. Exactly. Right, that's yes. the, okay. Um, and we have another question from Christine. How can you find a sourcing agent in the US? Any, any thoughts about that, Jared? So if you want to find a sourcing agent for the US in the US, I've never actually thought about that before. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll have to actually think about how that could be done because you know, uh, sourcing agents in China are highly valued just because, you know, communication, uh, um, yeah. mindset differences and everything like this. Uh, so there's, I think not what we're looking for is a sourcing agent, but more of a project manager, someone that can manage your projects. Yeah. Um, yeah. That would be, you know, the best thing because then that manager, maybe they can help you with the payment terms and they can help you with the delivery times and everything like that. How to find one um i'm not quite sure i can't even give you a reference of yeah who to work with that would be good um yeah we're you know in china there's there's a handful um right. gary i know you were doing this and you were very good at it so. yeah but in yeah. america it's a it's it's a different story yeah and then i, I can weigh in on this a little bit because um Please. you know not too many people are aware but you know i was born and raised in la and then growing up um, my mom, you know, she's a retired fashion designer, and then she had a small women's clothing line in the U.S., and everything was made locally in the U.S. in downtown L.A. There's like this whole fashion district in downtown L.A. So, you know, she was the manufacturer. In other words, she was like a very small factory. She had, you know, like like some workers with like, you know, sewing machines and stuff like that for the women's clothes. But she wasn't great at selling. Um, so at that time, she had like these... Um, like sales agents, um, basically they're like, you know, American like salespeople. And then they have relationships with like department stores, with like the big box retailers, like with Nordstrom, with Walmart, et cetera. And then they would have like a showroom um, in these places. Like, um, you know, if you're in fashion, like downtown LA, there's like the, um, there's like the California Mart, like the marketplace. And then they have like these fixed showrooms. So, I mean, for fashion, I know that these people, like these salespeople, if 
by definition, I mean, they're sourcing agents because they have contacts with all these like small mom and pop factory operations that can't afford to have like a showroom space. So, you know, I think one way is to, to look out for these people and, you know, possibly, you know, I know they go to trade shows as well. Obviously right now trade shows have stopped, but once they start again, I think that could be a, another way you can connect um, either locally, either directly with the factory or probably like sourcing agents or buyers, but um, just my two cents. And uh, another thing as well is that suppliers are always willing to refer other suppliers. And that's something that I see a lot of right now in the States is that they're always willing to recommend a partner factory or someone that they work with. Their friend has a factory. Um, right. It's kind of like kind of like uh, how I work with Ch in China as well. You, you kind of just refer people to that, you know, you've been working with for quite some time. You respect them. You trust them. Uh, you refer them. And it's the same thing in China. So if you're yeah. looking for plastics and electronics, you can find a plastic supplier and be like, hey, I also need an electronic supplier. Do you have any recommendations? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, you could bet that their recommendation is probably going to be pretty good. And vice versa, if you have, if you're speaking with an electronic supplier first, you could, you could ask them, hey, do you have any recommendations of who I should be speaking with for plastics? Um, right. And that will really help you to uh, get the ball rolling. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, great. Um, let's keep going. I want to make sure we get through Jared's presentation and then we'll get to your questions at the end. Um, so let's let's move forward if you're okay with that, Jared. I, um, all right. I know you had a very short case study comparing sourcing a product in the US versus China. Would you like to share your screen so um, yeah, we me, can see what that looks like? Let me uh, let me share it. Yeah. Hopefully. All right. We good? You can see it? Uh, just one sec. I'm going to add it to our window. OK. Can you guys see our screen? If you, if you can see it, just type yes in the chat window. Gary, let me know, because I, I'm just keeping this up now. I can see it. I can okay. see it. I just want to make sure. Well, let, let's just go ahead. I assume people can see it. Right? Yeah, OK, cool. Yeah. So what this is is a uh, comparison to make certain parts. You can see the materials for steel, plastic. Those are going to be the bigger ones. And I just threw an O-ring in there just because I got the quote for it today. Um, and you know, it, it breaks down the price of what it's going to cost for me to make it in China. And you know, my, I, I've been doing this for quite some time. We have very good trust with a lot of good suppliers and you know, I'm, I'm very confident that no matter what I get, it's going to be probably one of the most competitive prices you could find. Uh, and then I had that same thing quoted in America with some suppliers that I really just met. Um, so for, so let's take the first one, which is just a metal beam that's made of steel to make this in China, it's going to be 232 with 20% tariffs. Re remember I do 20% rather than 25 because, uh, suppliers, they're not going to say that the value is 232. They're going to decrease and Maybe they're going to say 225 or something that they could get away with to try to save you with some costs. Uh, I believe every supplier in China is guilty of this. Uh, so you're going to be paying about uh, 46 cents for um, for shipping this. And I was uh, I, w I was assuming that for one unit of this, we're going to be shipping about, it was going to be about one unit for C at the volume. Uh, this is not for the, the entire units. So um, this is not the full products. Uh, it's some of it. So... Uh, we found out that it's going to be about 15 cents for logistics to ship one, which is going to have it landed in America, maybe not even at your door for 293 and it takes 60 days, 30 days for production. That's usually the standard, 30 days for shipping, another standard. To get this made in America, it's going to cost 450 for four weeks. So this is what I'm saying that, you know, with some materials, it's not going to be as cost effective. What that's like a a buck 57 higher or something like that to be able to make it in America. That is, that could be a pretty big chunk. But if you go to the third example, it's going to be landed 25 cents. If you make that same part in America, it's only going to be 19 cents. And that's two cavities, which means that when you have a tool, there's going to be two parts in that cavity. If you increase that cavity size to four, meaning that one tool could have four products, you're going to get that for 12 cents, which is actually cheaper than you could get it for in China. And so this is really what opened my eyes. And I mean, even the next one, 32 cents. Um, and if you have a four cavity in America, it's 31 cents. So even if you compare it for leaving the machine, the product leaving the machine, not even taking into account 
shipping tariffs. It's already cheaper. Um, and it's going to take only four weeks. So, I mean, why would you not want to get that product faster and save a penny uh, for just X work? The, the next example is for another wooden, uh, sorry, a metal product, and it is a little higher. Uh, I have some quotes as well for wood, um, and they're also pretty comparable. I'm not sure if anyone here does do any wood products, uh, but they're pretty comparison. Uh, you know, they're pretty decent with comparison. And the last one is just a tiny part, I, but I still wanted to add it. Just, uh, you know, this is a very commoditized product. It's just an O-ring, a very basic size O-ring. Um, in America, in China, it's going to cost me two cents in America. Um, it's actually less than two cents. Uh, for some reason it wouldn't let me uh, extend it. It's actually 0 0.015. So a penny and a half. Um, and again, it's much faster uh, than what we could get it for in China. So the point of seeing this is that, you know, we can make it more efficient in America if we want to, um, there, it's going, there's going to be some difficulties with tooling because that's take the, the plastic holder, the second one. Um, that tool is going to cost me about $4,000 in, uh, in China to make. Uh, that same tool in America is going to cost me $35,000 to make. Uh, so it's a considerably much more expensive to make it in, uh, in America. However, if we have to make it in China, ship it to America, we have to put up with that lead time just once. Uh, and if you think about it for the first order, you don't gain any lead, uh, gain any time, you don't lose any time because no matter what, a product is going to have to be on the water or in the air, whether it's going to be mass production or if it's going to be tooling. So basically moving production over to America, moving a tool over to America, it just puts the tool on the product, uh, sorry, on the, uh, on, the, on the boat faster than the actual end products. Um, and the only things that, you know, if you guys are looking at doing this, you have to actually get the design of a tool and send it to your American supplier. Uh, that's probably going to be the biggest thing um, that you will have to do uh, just to make, you know, just to make sure that the, the, the tool that's going to be used um, in China could fit in a machine in America. Usually there's no issues with this, but you still will want to uh, double check and make sure. I see. Thanks for that breakdown. I know it was a little technical for you guys, and it may have been a little blurry, but um, if, if uh, I'm going to try to summarize what, what I took away from it. Jared, correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. And so Gary, if, it, if you need me to, I mean, I can email it to you if you want to share it with everyone. I'm, I apologize. Yeah. yeah, I apologize if it was blurry. It's Maybe it's just my connection isn't great. Yeah. Okay. No worries. Um, yeah. Well, we're happy to share it in the show notes. Okay. Um, so basically I understand that you can make it more efficiently in the U S if you want to, but tooling seems to be a big challenge because it's super expensive in the U S and then, um, and also you have to design the tool because the manufacturer may probably doesn't have the wherewithal to do this like they can in China. So you have to hire someone. Um, is it like an industrial designer or someone like that, that, that would do that, Jared? So industrial design is going to be great for like the, uh, for how it looks, but usually you're going to want to get with, uh, some sort of mechanical engineer or mechanical designer that is able to design the tool. Right. Right. Okay. Or so you my, my suggestion is always to ask the company that's making the tool to help you to design it. They're going to have the best idea about the wall sizes, the cavities and everything like this, just to make sure that you could get the, uh, the best tool for your buck. Right. Right. And then on the other hand, you can you get the tool from from China and then you know ship it over to the U.S. to your U.S. manufacturer and have them use it? Would that save you some some money? Yeah. So that's yeah. what we'll actually probably always do. We're all, we're always going to be getting them from either Taiwan or uh, Taiwan or China. Yeah, it's gonna, yeah. You know, it's going to save. I guess uh, it's my understanding that from Taiwan is going to be about half the price of getting it made in. Uh, America and China is about half the price of getting it made in Taiwan. Okay. And I, I assume the, the quality level in Taiwan would be a little higher than China. That's that's why you're paying more. Would that be right? Um, Not necessarily. Uh, I think there's a few factors in there. Uh, Taiwanese factories usually are a bit more expensive for everything. Their overheads right. usually higher. Salaries might be a, uh, you know, a bit higher and there's other circumstances. 
Uh, right. But in general, if you're working with a Taiwanese supplier, you should be getting pr some pretty good, some pretty good quality. Right. And of course, communication should be more streamlined. They right. speak, you know, their English is better over there. Okay, cool. All right. So, all right. Thanks for sharing that, that case study. Um, so next let's move on. Do you have any other, you know, we covered a lot today. Um, do you have any other best practices sourcing from the, the U S Jared, like maybe one, like your number one tip, like sourcing from the U S. Um, be very transparent. Um, I think, you know, like suppliers in the U S they're not going to accept any, uh, you know, um, any kind of manipulation with the quantities or anything like that. So make sure you're going to be very transparent. Even for me in, uh, in China, if someone lies about the quantities that they're, they're doing, or they even deceive us about what the product is for, we, we drop them automatically. And that's just because we invest a lot of time, energy, and sometimes we'll invest capital in those projects. So the last thing we want to do is be designing a pro product for the wrong industry because they were scared that we're going to knock it off or something like that. That's, that's not our goal. Um, that we've never done that. We won't do that. And American suppliers are going to react the same way. Uh, so be very transparent with what you're doing. Be honest, be very upfront. Um, because you know, they respect that. If you tell them that, you know, you have to get this made next month just to, you know, just to see if you could get a rise out of them to make them excited, you might actually get the wrong reaction. They might be like, well, there's nowhere enough time for us to make samples for us to get tooling for us to get this. So sorry, we're not interested. And then you're, you kind of have to start from, you know, day one. Um, U.S. suppliers, I like to have more of a streamlined approach. Um, they like to plan things more than, uh, you know, some of the other Chinese suppliers. They just want to get the order in so that the salesperson can make their commission and go out for dinner or whatever. Um, so the U.S., they, you know, they, they want things to be more streamlined, uh, more systematic. Uh, you have to provide them with all the materials. Um, and if you don't understand anything, ask say like hey i don't know what material this is but it's going to be outside or if it's, it's going to be exposed to sun um it's going to be in this type of environment it's uh, you know it can't rust because it's going to be in a like a container for 10 years or something like that and it's going to be quite humid so you know just you know we're people we all have different strengths we all have different advantages everyone's here their advantage is that they know how to sell in e-commerce e so that means you probably don't know materials you don't know engineering that well but the good thing is that you can leverage the services of some of these factories even these tier two suppliers which might just be making some some components they might be the best people to ask about what should this design look like how should this be made do you suggest a change with uh processes in order to make it more cost effective so you could definitely be leveraging them and communication will not be an issue. I've never had any communication with any of the suppliers so far, um, which is, I mean, I don't expect to, um, but you know, I'm, I'm all, always very honest with them. If I don't know something, I ask for their help and you guys should always do the same as well. Excellent. And then on the flip side, what are some common rookie mistakes that you're seeing these um, like entrepreneurs making when sourcing from the U S Oh, probably the same as they probably the same as they make in China. Uh, and I think you have more stories than I do with this. Um, so I, th I, th I think uh, if you're not going to do it in China, probably don't do it in America. Uh, that would probably be my my suggestion. Um, uh, but I mean, they're like I was saying, like we're all you know we're people, and you know there's really no dumb question. Um, they're not going to be investing into any tools um, or anything like that for you guys. So if you want to make a product in America, you're going to have to open up the tools. And it's kind of like if you want to go through my factory in China, we don't open up any tools. Uh, and that's, you know, we want to do it for equity or we're actually making investments. Um, we So you guys will have to pay for the tools. Uh, don't expect them to be uh, paying for the tools or anything like that. But the, you know, the bright side of that is that it's yours. No one else could sell that product. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a plus. It's going to be easier to expand on those products. Uh, you can market it differently. And, you know, I think there's a lot of flexibility of what you guys can do with your own, with your own product if, if any of you do decide to take this route. 
Oh, excellent. Sorry, my, my baby's crying in the background. We had one question from Robin. Uh, are there different regions for Mexico that specialize in specific product types? Do you think you can uh, tackle that? You know, that's a, that's a good question. That's a really good question because you could see the uh, like the shift of China. You could see it going from Shenzhen to Ningbo for commoditized products. Um, and America, um, where I'm at, it's great for manufacturing. We're you know in Cleveland. We're right next to Detroit. We we had the automotive industry. We had the steel industry. You know, you know for so long. So we have that built uh, infrastructure already in place. Um, so it's better than being in you know some of the other parts of the uh, of the world. California is probably a complete no no. Uh, Florida is probably the same. Um, you know, even to get land there is going to be relatively more expensive. Uh, so it's my understanding that Cleveland is actually a good place for uh, for manufacturing. There's a lot of larger corporations there in the ability to larger uh, companies. Um, so I would actually say the Midwest is a is a pretty decent place. Uh, we have everything here. We have uh, you know plastics, electronics, metals, wood, uh, wood like Amish countries, an hour south of where I'm at. So when I have a wood project, I just go down there. Um, so it's it's in this region where I'm at, it's actually pretty good. Um, so if, if if you're looking for a specific place, I would look somewhere you know in uh, Detroit, Cleveland, uh, this area. It's 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 good because of the history. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. My, my baby's crying in the background. Um, but yeah, thanks for that, that information. Um, just one second. So we have some other questions before we go, Jared, um, can you very quickly share before we go, um, what's the best way to connect to you for people that want to follow up? Yeah. So you can visit my website at epowercorp.com. That's E P O W E R C O R P.com. And you could just email me at Jared, J A R E D, at epowercorp.com. Uh, if anyone's on LinkedIn, you can find me on LinkedIn. I don't do Twitter or Facebook. Uh, so just LinkedIn or my website. And, you know, if you guys have any questions or if you just want to talk about the processes or anything like that, um, I don't think I answered everyone's questions. Uh, there's no way I could. There's, I think, like 140 or 120 questions here, which is unbelievable. So if there's any questions that I did not answer, you know, feel free to just, you know, send me a message and I'll definitely get back to you as quick as possible. All right. Excellent. Okay. Uh, we're just about out of time today. So, Jared, thank you so much for coming on. I uh, really wow. appreciate your time. And thank you, everybody, for watching. Uh, Jerry, could you repeat your email address uh, just so we can share that as well for people that want to connect? Yes, it is jared at epowercorp.com, J-A-R-E-D at epowercorp.com. I'm going to type it into a private chat. I'm not sure if anyone else could see that. Okay. So for anyone that wants to follow up, and can you share a little bit more about what you're doing in the U.S. now if, um, if anybody needs some help? Sure. So for a little bit of background, maybe I'll take you further back. Uh, we do uh, contract manufacturing. We have a 160,000 square foot facility in China, and we focus mostly on uh, higher end consumer goods, consumer electronics. Maybe they range from anything from about 50 parts to around a uh, maybe a, th a thousand unique parts. And they range from prices for many, uh, sorry, for MSRP, anything from maybe $50 to around $10,000 per, uh, per product. Um, and basically, my vision is to pick this factory up that we have and to implement it in America to give our clients, uh, you know, the option of whether to make it in uh, China or whether they want to make it in America. And it's, you know, it's we could leverage both countries that we're in and, you know, to try to get the best service that we want. Uh, so currently right now, we're just, we're trying to more get our supply chain in uh, intact because we're very advanced in China. We have hundreds of suppliers, too many to count, too many that any company honestly needs. Um, so we're trying to recreate this in America. And it's, uh, you know, it's been a good, you know, it's been actually a very good experience so far. Um, you know, more rewarding than doing it there. Uh, people are excited about the change. People are excited about the transition. They regret why this transition is coming, obviously, uh, due to, you know, the political tension and, you know, some of the social unrest that comes with it. Uh, but you know, it's, it's, it's definitely an opportunity and, uh, that's why we are starting it here.
and you know where the products we want to take on are not going to be you know that complicated maybe think you know anything from maybe something with five parts all the way up to maybe 200 parts or something like that for uh one product all right excellent thanks again uh everyone for watching and uh you know jared is just a wealth of knowledge i'm sure that he can be a potential you know partner in your success if you need some help sourcing from the us all right so uh thank you jared and thank you again everybody for tuning in and then we'll see you soon take thanks, care Jerry, i appreciate it take care